Part One, Chapter Two of In Chancery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Minter. The Foresight Saga, Two, In Chancery, by John Galsworthy. Part One, Chapter Two. Exit a man of the world. That a man of the world, so subject to the vicissitudes of fortune as Montague Darty, should still be living in a house he had inhabited twenty years at least, would have been more noticeable if the rent, rate, taxes, and repairs of that house had not been defrayed by his father-in-law. By that simple, if wholesale device, James Forsyte had secured a certain stability in the lives of his daughter and his grandchildren. After all, there is something invaluable about a safe roof over the head of a sportsman so dashing as Darty. Until the events of the last few days, he had been almost supernaturally steady all this year. The fact was, he had acquired a half-share in a filly of George Forsyte's, who had gone irreparably on the turf, to the horror of Roger, now stilled by the grave. Sleevelinks, by Martyr, out of shirt on fire, by Suspender, was a bay filly, three years old, who for a variety of reasons had never shown her true form. With half-ownership of this hopeful animal, all the idealism latent somewhere in Darty, as in every other man, had put up its head, and kept him quietly ardent for months past. When a man has something good to live for, it is astonishing how sober he becomes, and what Darty had was really good, a three-to-one chance for an autumn handicap, publicly assessed at twenty-five to one. The old-fashioned heaven was a poor thing beside it, and his shirt was on the daughter of Shirt on Fire. But how much more than his shirt depended on this granddaughter of Suspender? At that roving age of forty-five, trying to foresights, and though perhaps less distinguishable from any other age, trying even to darties. Montague had fixed his current fancy on a dancer. It was no mean passion, but without money, and a good deal of it, likely to remain a love as airy as her skirts, and Darty never had any money, subsisting miserably on what he could beg or borrow from Winifred, a woman of character, who kept him because he was the father of her children, and from a lingering admiration for those now dying Wardour Street good looks, which in their youth had fascinated her. She, together with any one else who would lend him anything, and his losses at cards and on the turf, extraordinary how some men make a good thing out of losses, were his whole means of subsistence, for James was now too old and nervous to approach, and Soames too formidably adamant. It is not too much to say that Darty had been living on hope for months. He had never been fond of money for itself, had always despised the Forsytes with their investing habits, though careful to make such use of them as he could. What he liked about money was what it bought, personal sensation. "'No real sportsman cares for money,' he would say, borrowing a pony if it was no use trying for a monkey. There was something delicious about Montague Darty. He was, as George Forsyte said, a daisy. The morning of the handicap dawned clear and bright, the last day of September, and Darty, who had travelled to Newmarket the night before, arrayed himself in spotless checks, and walked to an eminence to see his half of the filly take her final canter. If she won, he would be a cool three thou in pocket, a poor enough recompense for the sobriety and patience of these weeks of hope while they had been nursing her for this race, but he had not been able to afford more. Should he lay it off at the eight to one which she had advanced? This was his single thought, while the larks sang above him, and the grassy downs smelled sweet, and the pretty filly passed, tossing her head and glowing like satin. After all, if he lost it, it would not be he who paid, and to lay it off would reduce his winnings to some fifteen hundred, hardly enough to purchase a dancer out and out. Even more potent was the itch in the blood of all the darties for a real flutter. And turning to George, he said, "'She's a clipper. She'll win hands down. I shall go the whole hog.' George, who had laid off every penny, and a few besides, 
and stood to win however it came out, grinned down on him from his bulky height, with the words, "'So ho, my wild one!' For after a chequered apprenticeship, weathered with the money of a deeply complaining Roger, his foresight blood was beginning to stand him in good stead in the profession of owner. There are moments of disillusionment in the lives of men from which the sensitive recorder shrinks. Suffice it to say that if the good thing fell down, sleeve-links finished in the ruck, Darty's shirt was lost. Between the passing of these things and the day when Soames turned his face towards Green Street, what had not happened? When a man with the constitution of Montague Darty has exercised self-control for months from religious motives, and remains unrewarded, he does not curse God and die. He curses God and lives to the distress of his family. Winifred, a plucky woman, if a little too fashionable, who had borne the brunt of him for exactly twenty-one years, had never really believed that he would do what he did now. Like so many wives, she thought she knew the worst, but she had not yet known him in his forty-fifth year, when he, like other men, felt that it was now or never. Paying on the 2nd of October a visit of inspection to her jewel-case, she was horrified to observe that her woman's crown and glory was gone. The pearls which Montague had given her in eighty-six when Benedict was born, and which James had been compelled to pay for in the spring of eighty-seven, to save scandal. She consulted her husband at once. He pooh-poohed the matter. They would turn up. Nor, till she said sharply, "'Very well, then, Monty, I shall go down to Scotland Yard myself,' did he consent to take the matter in hand. Alas, that the steady and resolved continuity of design, necessary to the accomplishment of sweeping operations, should be liable to interruption by drink. That night Darty returned home without a care in the world, or a particle of reticence. Under normal conditions Winifred would merely have locked her door and let him sleep it off. But torturing suspense about her pearls had caused her to wait up for him. Taking a small revolver from his pocket, and holding on to the dining-table, he told her at once that he did not hear a curse whether she lived as long as she was quiet, but he himself was tired of life. Winifred, holding on to the other side of the dining-table, answered, "'Don't be a clown, Monty. Have you been to Scotland Yard?' Placing the revolver against his chest, Darty had pulled the trigger several times. It was not loaded. Dropping it with an imprecation, he muttered, "'For the shake of the children,' and sank into a chair. Winifred, having picked up the revolver, gave him some soda-water. The liquor had a magical effect. Life had deluged him. Winifred had never understood him. If he hadn't the right to take the pearls he had given her himself, who had? That Spanish filly had got them. If Winifred had any objection, he'd cut her throat. What was the matter with that? Probably the first usage of that celebrated phrase, so obscure are the origins of even the most classical language. Winifred, who had learned self-containment in a hard school, looked up at him and said, "'Spanish filly?' Do you mean that girl we saw dancing in the pandemonium ballet? Well, you're a thief and a blackguard. It had been the last straw on a sorely loaded consciousness. Reaching up from his chair, Darty seized his wife's arm, and, recalling the achievements of his boyhood, twisted it. Winifred endured the agony with tears in her eyes, but no murmur. Watching for a moment of weakness, she wrenched it free, then, placing the dining-table between them, said between her teeth, "'You are the limit, Monty!' Undoubtedly the inception of that phrase, so is English formed under the stress of circumstances. Leaving Darty with foam on his dark moustache, she went upstairs, and after locking her door and bathing her arm in hot water, lay awake all night, thinking of her pearls adorning the neck of another, and of the consideration her husband had presumably received therefore. The man of the world awoke with a sense of being lost to that world, and a dim recollection of having been called a limit. He sat for half an hour in the dawn and the armchair where he had slept, perhaps the unhappiest half-hour he had ever spent, for even to a darty there is something tragic about an end. 
and he knew that he had reached it. Never again would he sleep in his dining-room, and wake with the light filtering through those curtains, bought by Winifred at Nickens and Jarvis with the money of James. Never again eat a devilled kidney at that rosewood table, after a roll in the sheets and a hot bath. He took his note-case from his dress-coat pocket. Four hundred pounds in fives and tens, the remainder of the proceeds of his half of sleeve-links, sold last night, cash down to George Forsyte, who, having won over the race, had not conceived the sudden dislike to the animal which he himself now felt. The ballet was going to Buenos Aires the day after to-morrow, and he was going too. Full value for the pearls had not yet been received. He was only at the soup. He stole upstairs, not daring to have a bath or shave, besides the water would be cold. He changed his clothes, and packed stealthily all he could. It was hard to leave so many shining boots, but one must sacrifice something. Then, carrying a valise in either hand, he stepped out on to the landing. The house was very quiet, that house where he had begotten his four children. It was a curious moment, this, outside the room of his wife, once admired, if not perhaps loved, who had called him the limit. He steeled himself with that phrase, and tiptoed on. But the next door was harder to pass. It was the room his daughters slept in. Maud was at school, but Imogen would be lying there and moisture came into Darty's early morning eyes. She was the most like him of the four, with her dark hair and her luscious brown glance. Just coming out, a pretty thing. He set down the two valises. This almost formal abdication of fatherhood hurt him. The morning light fell on a face which worked with real emotion. Nothing so false as penitence moved him, but genuine paternal feeling, and that melancholy of never again. He moistened his lips, and complete irresolution for a moment paralysed his legs in their check trousers. It was hard, hard to be thus compelled to leave his home. "'Damn it!' he muttered. "'I never thought it would come to this.' Noises above warned him that the maids were beginning to get up, and grasping his two valises, he tiptoed on downstairs. His cheeks were wet and the knowledge of that was comforting, as though it guaranteed the genuineness of his sacrifice. He lingered a little in the rooms below, to pack all the cigars he had, some papers, a crush hat, a silver cigarette box, a rough guide. Then, mixing himself a stiff whisky and soda, and lighting a cigarette, he stood hesitating before a photograph of his two girls in a silver frame. It belonged to Winifred. "'Never mind,' he thought. "'She can get another taken, and I can't.' He slipped it into the valise. Then, putting on his hat and overcoat, he took two others, his best malacca cane, an umbrella, and opened the front door. Closing it softly behind him, he walked out, burdened as he had never been in all his life, and made his way round the corner to wait there for an early cab to come by. Thus had passed Montague Darty, in the forty-fifth year of his age, from the house which he had called his own. When Winifred came down, and realised that he was not in the house, her first feeling was one of dull anger, that he should thus elude the reproaches she had carefully prepared in those long wakeful hours. He had gone off to Newmarket or Brighton, with that woman as likely as not, disgusting. Forced to a complete reticence before Imogen and the servants, and aware that her father's nerves would never stand the disclosure, she had been unable to refrain from going to Timothy's that afternoon, and pouring out the story of the pearls to Aunt Julie and Hester, in utter confidence. It was only on the following morning that she noticed the disappearance of that photograph. What did it mean? Careful examination of her husband's relics prompted the thought that he had gone for good. As that conclusion hardened, she stood quite still in the middle of his dressing-room, with all the drawers pulled out, to try and realise what she was feeling. By no means easy. Though he was the limit, he was yet her property, and for the life of her she could not but feel the poorer. To be widowed, yet not widowed, at forty-two, with four children, made conspicuous, an object of commiseration, gone to the arms of a Spanish jade. Memories, feelings which she had thought quite dead, 
revived within her, painful, sullen, tenacious. Mechanically she closed drawer after drawer, went to her bed, lay on it, and buried her face in the pillows. She did not cry. What was the use of that? When she got off her bed to go down to lunch, she felt as if only one thing could do her good, and that was to have Val home. He, her eldest boy, who was to go to Oxford next month at James's expense, was at Littlehampton, taking his final gallops with his trainer for smalls, as he would have phrased it following his father's diction. She caused a telegram to be sent to him. "'I must see about his clothes,' she said to Imogen. "'I can't have him going up to Oxford, or anyhow. Those boys are so particular.' "'Val's got heaps of things,' Imogen answered. "'I know, but they want overhauling. I hope he'll come.' "'He'll come like a shop, mother, but he'll probably skew his exam.' "'I can't help that,' said Winifred. "'I want him.' With an innocent, shrewd look at her mother's face, Imogen kept silent. It was father, of course. Val did come like a shot at six o'clock. Imagine a cross between a pickle and a foresight, and you have young Publius Valerius Darty. A youth so named could hardly turn out otherwise. When he was born, Winifred, in the heyday of spirits and the craving for distinction, had determined that her children should have names such as no others had ever had. It was a mercy, she felt now, that she had not just named Imogen Thisbe. But it was to George Forsyte, always a wag, that Val's christening was due. It so happened that Darty, dining with him a week after the birth of his son and heir, had mentioned this aspiration of Winifred's. "'Call him Cato,' said George. "'It'll be damn piquant.' He had just won a tenor on a horse of that name. "'Cato?' Darty had replied. They were a little on, as the phrase was, even in those days. It's not a Christian name. "'Hello, you,' George called to a waiter in knee-breeches. "'Bring me the Encyclopedia Brit from the library. Let us see.' The waiter brought it. "'Here you are,' said George, pointing with his cigar. "'Cato, Publius Valerius, by Virgil, out of Lydia. That's what you want. Publius Valerius is Christian enough.' Darty, on arriving home, had informed Winifred. She had been charmed. It was so chic. And Publius Valerius became the baby's name, though it afterwards transpired that they had got hold of the inferior Cato. In 1890, however, when little Publius was nearly ten, the word chic went out of fashion, and sobriety came in. Winifred began to have doubts. They were confirmed by little Publius himself, who returned from his first term at school, complaining that life was a burden to him. They called him Pubby. Winifred, a woman of real decision, promptly changed his school and his name to Val, the Publius being dropped, even as an initial. At nineteen he was a limber, freckled youth, with a wide mouth, light eyes, long dark lashes, a rather charming smile, considerable knowledge of what he should not know, and no experience of what he ought to do. Few boys had more narrowly escaped being expelled, the engaging rascal. After kissing his mother and pinching Imogen, he ran upstairs three at a time and came down four, dressed for dinner. He was awfully sorry, but his trainer, who had come up too, had asked him to dine at the Oxford and Cambridge. It wouldn't do to miss. The old chap would be hurt. Winifred let him go with an unhappy pride. She had wanted him at home, but it was very nice to know that his tutor was so fond of him. He went out with a wink at Imogen, saying, "'I say, mother, could I have two plover's eggs when I come in? Cook's got some. They top up so jolly well. Oh, and look here, have you any money? I had to borrow a fiver from old Snobby.' Winifred, looking at him with fond shrewdness, answered, "'My dear, you are naughty about money, but you shouldn't pay him to-night anyway. You're his guest.' How nice and slim he looked in his white waistcoat, and his dark, thick lashes. "'Oh, but we may go to the theatre, you see, mother, and I think I ought to stand the tickets. He's always hard up, you know.' Winifred produced a five-pound note, saying, "'Well, perhaps you'd better pay him, but you mustn't stand the tickets, too.' Val pocketed the fiver. "'If I do, I can't,' he said. "'Good night, mum.' He went out with his head up and his hat cocked joyously, sniffing the air of Piccadilly like a young hound loosed into a covert. "'Jolly good biz!' off that mouldy old slow hole down there. 
He found his tutor, not indeed at the Oxford and Cambridge, but at the Goats Club. This tutor was a year older than himself, a good-looking youth with fine brown eyes and smooth dark hair, a small mouth, an oval face, languid, immaculate, cool to a degree, one of those young men who, without effort, establish moral ascendancy over their companions. He had missed being expelled from school a year before Val, had spent that year at Oxford, and Val could almost see a halo round his head. His name was Crum, and no one could get through money quicker. It seemed to be his only aim in life, dazzling to young Val, in whom, however, the foresight would stand apart now and then, wondering where the value for that money was. They dined quietly in style and taste, left the club smoking cigars with just two bottles inside them, and dropped into stalls at the Liberty. For Val, the sound of comic songs, the sight of lovely legs, were fogged and interrupted by haunting fears that he would never equal Crumb's quiet dandyism. His idealism was roused, and when that is so, one is never quite at ease. Surely he had too wide a mouth, not the best cut of waistcoat, no braid on his trousers, and his lavender gloves had no thin black stitchings down the back. Besides, he laughed too much. Crumb never laughed. He only smiled, with his regular dark brows raised a little, so that they formed a gable over his just drooped lids. No, he would never be Crumb's equal. All the same, it was a jolly good show, and Cynthia Dark simply ripping. Between the acts, Crumb regaled him with particulars of Cynthia's private life and the awful knowledge became Val's, that, if he liked, Crumb could go behind. He simply longed to say, I say, take me, but dared not because of his deficiencies, and this made the last act or two almost miserable. On coming out, Crumb said, It's half an hour before they close. Let's go on to the pandemonium. They took a hansom to travel the hundred yards, and seats costing seven and six apiece, because they were going to stand, and walked into the promenade. It was in these little things, this utter negligence of money, that Crumb had such engaging polish. The ballet was on its last legs and night, and the traffic of the promenade was suffering for the moment. Men and women were crowded in three rows against the barrier. The whirl and dazzle on the stage, the half-dark, the mingled tobacco fumes and women's scent, all that curious lure to promiscuity which belongs to promenades, began to free young Val from his idealism. He looked admiringly in a young woman's face, saw she was not young, and quickly looked away. Shades of Cynthia Dark. The young woman's arm touched his unconsciously. There was a scent of musk and mignonette. Val looked round the corner of his lashes. Perhaps she was young, after all. Her foot trod on his. She begged his pardon. He said, "'Not at all. A jolly good ballet, isn't it?' "'Oh, I'm tired of it. Aren't you?' Young Val smiled, his wide, rather charming smile. Beyond that he did not go, not yet convinced. The foresight in him stood out for greater certainty. And on the stage the ballet whirled its kaleidoscope of snow-white, salmon-pink, and emerald-green and violet, and seemed suddenly to freeze into a stilly, spangled pyramid. Applause broke out, and it was over. Maroon curtains had cut it off. The semicircle of men and women round the barrier broke up. The young woman's arm pressed his. A little way off, disturbance seemed centering round a man with a pink carnation. Val stole another glance at the young woman, who was looking towards it. Three men, unsteady, emerged, walking arm in arm. The one in the centre wore the pink carnation, a white waistcoat, a dark moustache. He reeled a little as he walked. Crumb's voice said, slow and level, Look at that bounder! He's screwed! Val turned to look. The bounder had disengaged his arm, and was pointing straight at them. Crumb's voice, level as ever, said, He seems to know you. The bounder spoke. Hello, he said, you flows. Look, there's my young rascal of a son. Val saw. It was his father. He could have sunk into the crimson carpet. It was not the meeting in this place, not even that his father was screwed. It was Crumb's word, bounder, which, as by heavenly revelation, he perceived at that moment to be true. Yes, 
His father looked a bounder, with his dark good looks, and his pink carnation, and his square self-assertive walk. And without a word he ducked behind the young woman and slipped out of the promenade. He heard the word, Val, behind him, and ran down deep carpeted steps, past the chuckers out into the square. To be ashamed of his own father is perhaps the bitterest experience a young man can go through. It seemed to Val, hurrying away, that his career had ended before it had begun. How could he go up to Oxford now, amongst all those chaps, those splendid friends of Crumb's, who would know that his father was a bounder? And suddenly he hated Crumb. Who the devil was Crumb to say that? If Crumb had been beside him at that moment, he would certainly have been jostled off the pavement. His own father! His own! A choke came up in his throat, and he dashed his hands down deep into his overcoat pockets. Damn Crumb! He conceived the wild idea of running back and fending his father, taking him by the arm and walking about with him in front of Crumb, but gave it up at once, and pursued his way down Piccadilly. A young woman planted herself before him. "'Not so angry, darling!' He shied, dodged her, and suddenly became quite cool. If Crumb ever said a word, he would jolly well punch his head, and there would be an end of it. He walked a hundred yards or more, contented with that thought, then lost its comfort utterly. It wasn't simple like that. He remembered how, at school, when some parent came down who did not pass the standard, it just clung to the fellow afterwards. It was one of those things nothing could remove. Why had his mother married his father, if he was a bounder? It was bitterly unfair. Jolly low down on a fellow to give him a bounder for a father. The worst of it was that now Crum had spoken the word, he realised that he had long known subconsciously that his father was not the clean potato. It was the beastliest thing that had ever happened to him, the beastliest thing that had ever happened to any fellow. And downhearted as he had never yet been, he came to Green Street, and let himself in with a smuggled latch-key. In the dining-room his plover's eggs were set invitingly, with some cut bread and butter, and a little whisky at the bottom of a decanter. Just enough, as Winifred had thought, for him to feel himself a man. It made him sick to look at them, and he went upstairs. Winifred heard him pass, and thought, "'The dear boy's in, thank goodness. If he takes after his father I don't know what I shall do.' But he won't. He's like me. Dear Val. End of part one. Chapter two.